Oh, yeah. Sorry, there's supposed to be two more people on the panel. I'm going to give them a couple more minutes to see if they can make it. And, you know, if not, we'll just get started. So, I know. I was being. Maybe quiet. we can kill time by just introducing who is up here. Okay, so, when well, they yeah. do come. We'll, so we'll start with that. My name is Gabe. I'm with Thinking Outside the Long Box podcast. I'll be moderating your panel today. And I will let you guys introduce yourselves because though I have little bios written down on you, I don't want to screw anything up. So, so. Go ahead and go for it. Um, all right. Um, my name is Dan Parent. Well, jeez. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm primarily known for my work with Archie Comics. I've been there for 30 years. And um, yeah, I have my own creator own series now called Die Kitty Die. Um, so yeah, I'm, Archie's still keeping me busy. I'm still uh, um, working on Archie and Kevin Keller and the whole the whole gang. So. Uh, I'm Justin Ponser. I, uh, I'm a colors for Marvel. Uh, been doing a lot of thing, <laughs> a lot of things there over the years, including like uh, Young Avengers, Miles Morales, uh, uh, Defenders now, stuff like that. So, uh, yeah. hey, George Genty. Um, I'm an artist in the business. Uh, with I've been doing Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Serenity, a lot of the Joss Whedon stuff for a lot of years. But I think. For this, it's the, the diversity, right? Um, I did the uh, Bishop book way back when, and uh, I did a, a book with uh, John Ridley, who's a, a, a Hollywood guy. He uh, he actually won the Academy Award last year for 12 Years a Slave. Uh, he's a big comic fan, and we did a book about 10 years ago called The American Way, which was about the first black superhero in America in the 60s. Um, I've done a various titles, some ethnic and, and whatnot, but yeah, so should be an interesting panel. So as, as he mentioned, this is uh, Diversity in Comics. The panel is going to be just us talking about how uh, we view the industry uh, as a whole when it comes to diversity, whether that be uh, females, which there was supposed, supposed to be a female to panel member, so I'm not going to speak to that because I have no right to, <laughs> and uh, just kind of We'll be talking about, you know, diversity as regards to race and characters and comic books, sexuality, you know, all I, that stuff. I, if I can interject, I hate that it's gotten so PC to the point where you would have to say something like, since I'm not a woman, I can't speak to that. Oh, I mean, I just don't, I don't feel comfortable actually saying as a woman because well, I'm not. Yeah, you're not speaking <laughs> as a woman, but, and I was, I was telling Justin here as we were walking in, as if you're telling me that Storm, from the X-Men was created by Marv Wolfman. I honestly would much rather hear from him than say a black woman who reads comics. You know, it's like, well, that's great and you have your point of view, but the idea that race, I, I don't, and being of a race, uh, the idea that race has to play a part in it, I, I don't know that I, or race or, or gender has to play a part. I don't know that I agree 100% that that person is the best person to speak on a subject. That'll lead into my first question, but first go ahead and introduce yourself since we got started. Dexter Vines, whoa, is that right? Dexter Vines, Hail Hydra. <laughs> Best intro ever. <laughs> uh, so that kind of leads into my first question. Uh, what, what I've been really kind of fascinated when it comes to diversity in comics is as creators, uh, as you know, artists and writers and, and people that work in the industry, do you feel that it's more important to have more diverse characters in the comics or more diverse creators that are making the comics so that the reality of the stories from the creator standpoints are effectively bleeding into the books as opposed to somebody that isn't familiar with, you know, being a woman or, you know, being black or being Hispanic or being whatever? is still like, like you said, you're more interested in hearing what Marv Wolfman has to say about Storm than a black lady has to say about Storm. Like, you know, how, which do you guys feel is, is more important? Well, I think a misconception too. There have been a lot of ethnically diverse individuals 
in comic books back in the 60s, 70s, and whatnot, you just never really knew about it because you did, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have all of this social media the way it is now. So you really didn't know. You assumed George Perez was maybe Spanish because his last name was Perez or Ruben, uh, uh, a lot of the, um, what, what they would call the South American artists for Warren Magazine. A lot of those guys weren't American at all. They were, you know, Hispanic and whatnot. So I don't think we, uh, and there was Marie Severin. There were women in the business also. We just didn't pay that much attention to the titles of the names when we were younger or in that time frame. But there was a lot of diversity back then. There really wasn't just, you know, the Stan Lee and Jack Kirby's or the Neil Adams. There were so many other artists as well. Yeah. <laughs> and I shut them down. There you go. Uh, how do you how do you guys feel? Like what do, what do you feel is more important? Like diverse creators or diverse characters? Well, I think it's both. Uh, yeah. I think the diverse creators will bring in, you know, their diversity just naturally. I think it's just something you do uh hopefully not even thinking about it. It's just So I think definitely both. So uh I think and now you definitely it seems like half the people I work with now are in other countries, you know, whereas I remember, you know, back in the day when I first got into comics, you pretty much had to be in the States, you know, and then, you know, FedEx and then, you know, we started kind of getting out there. Now, we, like I say, with the Internet age, you know, it's pretty much gone globally. You know, I pretty much work with a lot of guys in South America and Asia, the Philippines, you name it, I've, you know, so I think it's just a... But I think that happened organically. I don't think that was forced or anything like that. I think just the, the more things kind of branched out with, you know, the internet and stuff, people realized, hey, I can, you know, do comics from here, you know. Uh, the way we, you know, on our podcast, we talk a lot to a lot of independent creators, you know, guys that don't necessarily have a comic book deal, and that's what they've done. They've gone on to like DeviantArt or something like that, found somebody whose art style matches what they're writing, and they're working with some guy that's in the Philippines, you right. know, that there's even like language barriers and things like that. Like, do you find that the internet age is kind of smoothing over some of those gaps where if you have the talent, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be anything like you're not sitting in the Marvel bullpen doing something right, like right. you can literally just. Yeah, create. definitely. Now, if you're talented and your work is out there and people can see it and, you know, all it takes is one editor to see some of your work like, hey, I think this guy is good. Yeah. You know, we'll see if I can, you know, reach out to him and, you know, get him on something. But see, then you're going more past diversity and it becomes cultural. The Japanese has a, have a very specific way of telling a story. The Europeans the, the, from the UK or, or from South America, they have very specific storytelling time, even their movies. I mean, it's not so different. You, you watch a Japanese film or you watch an American film and there, there is a subtle difference that you do see. Um, and I think that doesn't have necessarily to do with the diversity of their race. It's more their culture and their upbringing and how they, you know, the, the idea of how some people do certain things is different from, I guess, uh, continent to continent. So that, I think, once it becomes a global issue, becomes less about diversity and more about your cultural upbringing. Our last panelist is here. Go ahead and introduce yourself real quick. Hi, my name's Aletha Martinez. Wow, it was a hike to get here. I feel like down there. <laughs> it's crazy. I'm not going to lie. I got lost at least three times trying to find this room. So I had a Sherpa. <laughs> uh, so, you know, kind of, kind of going on the cultural aspect, when you're looking at, like, different cultures, you know, like you said, Japanese or, like, French comics, they have very different comic see. traditions. Do you find that... Uh, so people from people from other countries do they ever have a problem bridging a gap making american comics or is it just a matter of like artistic talent no i think if it's good it will it's good. it'll yeah. feel people will pick it up or get it i was at i was in mexico city a couple of years ago and civil war and old man logan i must have signed a you know thousands of copies of those books when i was in, in you know in, in mexico and they loved the story just as much as you know an American artist did, so it was it was great. That's awesome. So, but I think yeah, in the end, if it's a good story, it'll it'll cross all borders and barriers and all that good stuff. And I, I know Archie's found a lot of artists online like that randomly. If they just saw someone who had a style that was really interesting, whether it's on DeviantArt Art or wherever, and then they've they've you know hired them. They'll get them to do like a variant cover, and then if it works out, they're drawing stories. 
That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Which was something that you, before in the old days, you know, you had a, your pick of five or six artists that you knew about, you know, and that, you know, so, but it's, that's changed a lot. So uh, w- <clears throat> one thing that I, I was kind of interested in hearing about from you guys with, you know, with the benefits of the Internet age, there's also the drawbacks of the Internet age. You know, Thor is a woman and everybody loses their minds. You know, a character goes from being, you know, a white guy to an Asian guy and a bunch of people lose their minds. How do you guys feel like mainstream publishers could bridge the gap so that people don't feel like, you know, okay, we're going to force this diversity on you? How do you feel like the mainstream publishers could be more organic with their creations so that people aren't so like hesitant to to accept different ideas in their comic books i think uh if you read the books they do a good job with the story making it organic to the story but the headline becomes oh now so and so has become such and such and the outrage that, ensues yeah and they just run with it they don't they aren't reading where they they develop a story so that they're, you know, smoothly transitioning. Where, uh, you know, the characters, if they don't, if no change occurs in these stories, you can't have somebody just be the same for 60 years and maintain where it's still interesting. You know, you have to progress and move things along. And so I thought they'd done a good job, if you read the books, of like, you know, and they're not just shoehorning things in. They've come up with a good story, a good reason to do all that sort of stuff. But uh, you just have to get past the headlines of, you know, of, well, oh, now so and so and such and such. You do, but most of those things you've mentioned, Marvel has done to a <laughs> specific degree. And I think more than diversity, Marvel is just interested in selling books. And if we can create some sort of a hype by saying Thor is now a woman, let's go with that. Because as much as I, and I grew up on Marvel, I love Marvel. And in a, in a weird way, I, as I get older, I feel a little betrayed by Marvel because there really is no continuity anymore. There's just the, well, if this is something, you know, if Grant Morrison comes in and he wants to make Superman, uh, you know, a lesbian or something, he can probably get away with it because that's what Grant Morrison's popularity can do. It does, not that he would do that, of course, but it just doesn't feel like they're respecting the character. And I understand you have a character that's been around for 75 years. You got to do something with them. But the idea of that challenge doesn't necessarily mean let's erase everything they ever were and try this. Well, I think part of that now, everything is in arcs, six, six issue arcs or 12 issue arcs or whatever it may be. Whereas back in the day, you know, I remember when I first started collecting comic books, Chris Claremont was the writer on X-Men. And generally any mutant title, Chris Claremont had it. And you could read it and they would, he would refer back to, you know, something happened in, you know, X-Men 222. You know, we refer back to that, you know, and it was, you could refer back and see it. And now it's like, it may, it may be different because we're in the business now because it seems like when I get approached and stuff, well, we got six issues. It may go longer than six issues, but we're going to see how, you know, these six issues go. And I think that it's just the, the entry has kind of become more chopped up. So it seems like we always got it. Now we got a female Thor or now we got a female Iron Man or, you know, and it just it seems that way, whether, you know, like you said, a lot of these stories you read and they'll actually kind of build up to it. But, yeah, from the outside if you're not reading those titles, it definitely seems like, all right, it just seems like somebody said, hey, let's just make this person, you know, the opposite of what it was yesterday. <laughs> yeah, just and throw a dart at a chart. Like, right. They're going to be a, you know, and, and it, it, I think it just comes off that way, whereas I think they're thinking it out a little bit more than uh, some people on the outrage side. <laughs> Can I say something really terrible? I just think they're afraid to make new characters. People aren't buying comics like they did before. Oh, yeah. If you want to do diversity something new, how about give me a new character? Oh, yeah. Do not take my Thor, but I just, just learned to love. Right. And you make him a woman, I'm not buying that. And like and introduce I it and build his character. Yes. Or that, you or could that, have given me somebody new. Yeah. Don't they have others? No, you take Thor. Beloved Thor. <laughs> I hate to Did say, with Thor, him? I would argue that because Thor... You're they, a man. You don't get to no, tell me about they, Thor. They did, that. <laughs> <laughs> they did the same thing years ago with Beta Ray Bill. They took away Thor's power and made Beta He's Ray hideous. Thor. Thor's and God Thor was an beautiful. alien. Or Beta Ray was just an alien. Again. So making him a woman... Somebody's a Thor fan. I get it, but... No, I became a Thor The idea fan of that, it just it seems okay if you're going to say that the title of Thor 
is asexual. It doesn't really matter who Thor is. Odin's son is that individual, sure, but the title of Thor could easily go to any one of those Asgardians or someone else who proves themselves worthy. I love you, but well, I this cannot agree with that. turned into a nerd argument super I'm fast. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I, I understand what you're saying, because having read the Thor run up into the transition to, uh, spoiler, Jane being Thor, like, you know, it made sense within the confines of the comic book, but, you know, when that first issue came out, it was, this is issue one. Oh, by the way, Thor's a lady now. Yeah. So all these people are picking up issue one with not necessarily having read, you know, the stuff that was in the back building up to that. Like, do you think that desire, like you said, for Marvel or DC to just sell insane amount of books, let's release a number one every three months. Do you think that plays into this almost like unintentional, hey, we're going to shoehorn something in? Like, do you think that plays into that somehow, or...? Yes. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Very direct answer. <laughs> what, what do you guys feel is kind of the end game for diversity in comics? Like, what do you think, in like a utopian world, what does diversity in comic books look like? To get to a point where we don't have to talk about it like this anymore. Yeah. <laughs> when it's organic and natural and I pick up a book just because I like it and it happens to have this person, not this forced thing that just feels so like, okay, now they're black and this is special. You're not special because you're black. You're not special because you're Spanish. These things don't make you special. These things are not what last. We don't buy Superman just because of that. We, it was iconic. It was that figure. When we saw Wonder Woman, she came bigger. She was better. She was bigger. Something about her was just iconic. When we don't have this discussion anymore, when I'm not sitting here talking about being a woman in comics, then we've arrived. Up until then, I'm not too sure what we're doing. We're spinning our wheels. Yeah, that, that deserves that. I, you know, I could give you some stats as to if you want to talk diversity, why this actually happens. It's because a majority of the readers are Caucasian. A minority of the readers are African American or Hispanic. They just don't read a large number of books. And mind you, I have been on three or four black titles, titles that were black people and they were, they were doing black things and black world and <laughs> they were just black and they did not sell. And I had some, I was working with some really good writers and things like that and they didn't sell. One guy, in a weird way, put it very succinctly to me. I was, uh, years ago, I was doing Bishop, uh, and they wanted to, you know, go off. This was back in 2000. And he, they wanted to have his own title, and, you know, every Marvel was really doing well with the X Men. And they basically said, yeah, we're going to take Bishop, and he's going to go on this sort of Lord of the Rings trilogy thing, and he's going to go do his own stuff. And I was at a show signing books, and one of the guys came up to me. And he said, oh, yeah, no, I heard about that title, and that's great. But now that they were taking Bishop out of the Marvel Universe, he felt he didn't have to read the book anymore. Because it was a character that he wasn't necessarily, you know, it was a white gentleman. He wasn't necessarily interested in. It was just something where he was obligated to pick it up because Bishop at that time was part of the X-Men. And unfortunately, we could sit here and go, well, okay, well, where were all the black readers? If they finally had their one title to say, here, you wanted an X-Men who wasn't Storm, here's your title, well, where, where are they? You know, it's, it's a sad truth, and while Milestone, Milestone, Milestone didn't make it ultimately, is because I feel in a way that Milestone was very militant. That was DC's try at doing an all-black uh, title for uh, DC's imprint back a few years ago. And a lot of it didn't work because I think they catered towards a very small percentage of African Americans and excluded everybody else. And the, the sad truth is that it is more, there are, or there isn't as much diversity as we would like in books, as much as we would all like to see that and live in a perfect world, and I agree with you. But those are the numbers, and I only know that because I have done these titles that have, you know, our good titles were popular, succeeded, but failed very quickly because everybody sort of got the impression. And I think now, I don't know what the numbers are to uh, Black Panther, but I picked up Black Panther thinking I'm reading it, 
And I got to tell you, it just felt like everything felt like it was in Wakanda and the Wakanda way of life and all of this. I'm like, I honestly don't care as much about as Wakanda. I was curious about Black Panther, the way he was in the uh, Civil War movie. I liked the interaction that he had and that comic book for me. And I know they got a very popular writer. Uh, I forget the gentleman's name, but I know he was very... Tananasi Coates. I'm sorry? Tananasi Coates. Right. He and Because he was more popular for writing... Like he writes for the he Atlantic. He writes Hollywood yeah. stuff. Yeah. So, his first comic stuff, I believe. And that was, yeah, his first foray into comics. And I don't know what the numbers are, but from what I've read, that they have really gone down as a result because it, it centered too much on life in Africa. And I think people wanted more either his part in the Avengers or what he was like as an individual with whatever cool powers that he had. So, so I had a question that was specifically for you, Dan. Mm -hmm. uh, as a writer on Archie, like right. Archie isn't exactly known for like being the most like diverse or like open anything. Right. right. Creating the first openly gay character in Archie Comics, mm -hmm. what was that experience like? I mean, how how do you even approach that in the world of Betty and Veronica, you know? Well, we had been coming off a good, a good <laughs> like, I don't know, I would say 20 years of uh, a very white bread <laughs> society, you know, very 1950s sort of like right. feel to Archie. And really, we, it was just new management came into Archie. Um, the other guys who owned the company passed away. We we're like, okay, let's put Archie in the 21st century. Um, the, the pages look very just white. <laughs> so, and, and straight. So, you know, we, were, we had been adding more diversity into the, you know, into Riverdale. Um, and then we were, we were having a discussion. We we're like, can we have a gay character in Riverdale? And we we're like, well, why, why not? You know, we're, we're like, this is the 21st century. You know, we're living in an era now where, you know, there's, we see gay people on TV and in our, you know, different forms of entertain, entertainment. Why not Archie Comics? And then we wrestled back and forth. Well, do we make one of the characters come out or do we just create a new character? And we, we, we created Kevin and I think that was the right way to go because we could create his own history. We didn't have to go back and, you know, if we had made Jughead gay. Which people We're thought trying was, to figure it out. Which how people can thought, we, how people can thought we that make was. This? Yeah, how do we go back and what about this storyline where he was interested in girls? Right, you know, right. How do we go back and rewrite all that? So it's easier just to start with a new character, and and you know the character worked because we. The other thing too is we wanted to be really careful that we weren't just doing the the very special issue of Archie with a new gay character and then you never hear it from him again. We're like, we got to make this a good character, a character who's going to stick around. So we sort of um, figured he'd be a friend of Veronica. But when we brought him into the Archie books, he debuted in Veronica. The storyline was Veronica sees Kevin and has the hots for him, and he's just not interested. And of course, Veronica gets any guy she wants, but of course she's not going to get Kevin, obviously. Right. And, and, and everybody figures out or knows that he's gay except for Veronica. So she's like the last person on earth to figure out that he's gay. And it just, so it, we kind of played it that it made a good Archie story with our new character of Kevin. We didn't just, it, we didn't, you know, just say this is, you know, we didn't ram it down anybody's throat. And then the character became popular. Um, now he's been around like seven years now. And now Kevin is just one of the gang. Like, you know, Kevin's in stories, you know, it's, he, he, you know, it's, it's not, um, it's not a big deal anymore. It's like real life. It's when he, your friend comes out and then you're like, oh, okay, he's still my friend. It doesn't matter. He, he's one of the, he's one of the Archie gang. And, um, you know, that's, he's, he's Kevin. That's cool. And that's really what we were really gearing towards was with making Kevin a regular part of, of the Archie, you know, Archie world. That's awesome. I like I, I like that. I, that was probably the most fascinating thing to to have come across kind of like my news feeds and stuff over the last few years cuz like I mean like I said Archie is just like the standard like look how boring these, you know, people can come across <laughs> sure, because they're sure. so yeah. <laughs> and we wanted, you know, we wanted to, you know, kids read Archie comics. Yeah. Kids know kids have kids are the most you know unbiased, unprejudiced people you're going to see. So all of the, the any kind of bias and prejudice that came out was from everybody over 30 or 40. <laughs> kids were fine with Kevin. Kids love Kevin. Um, they had no problem with a gay character. Right. Um, they some of the parents did, <laughs> but the kids were fine with it. So when you guys are are looking at you know the comics that you're creating, what do you feel like? 
is your input into developing like more nuanced characters and better characters for the comic books that you guys are working on? Like, what do you feel is your personal like contribution going into it uh, to create basically a more diverse like feel to to the comics industry? Well, I hate to say, too, technically, Marvel and DC are the harder companies to really create something because, A, they own it, and B, they already tell you, look, we have this mass stable of characters. If you're writing for us, we would prefer if you came in and wrote this. They don't want to pay you royalties on a new character, of course, because that's money they're taking out of their pockets. Um, a good example is... Um, Green Lantern, I'm sure everybody's familiar with Green, uh, Green Lantern. Uh, the Kyle Reiner version of Green Lantern was created by Ron Mars and Daryl Banks. And I, I, was, I was friendly with Daryl for many years and I talked to him and said, well, how does that work? Because you guys never created Green uh, Lantern, but you've created this new character with a new outfit and that whole thing. And they're like, yeah, DC doesn't give us any royalties per se. We don't have any creator own. But we do get a little kickback every Christmas, he said, just because of what we did. That It wasn't recognized outright, but they did get a little something. So that makes it, I think, harder for a creative team to go in and say, well, we want to do this and have them act around your characters. And in this day and age, if you're going to do that, you know, you have, it's so easy to publish your own book nowadays. So why invest in, in a big corporate and say, here, we want this character to be part of the Marvel Universe, when you're going to lose a lot of that intimacy you have with that character, then just go and play with one of the characters they already have, like making one of the Alpha Flight gay, or, you know, it's like, okay, if we need a gay character, well, let's just look in our arsenal and see who can we make as gay, or, you know, who can be black, or who can be a woman, who can do all these things, and that's just the, the corporation that you're up against, with certainly a Marvel in DC. Um, and I only use them because they probably have the biggest stable of, of cre uh, actual characters. A Dark Horse or a IDW or Dynamite, they don't, they publish series more so that are already creator owned rather than creating their own characters. I think in uh, recently, all the years I've worked in comics, when I worked on World of Wakanda, they had 18 new characters that had no look to them that they needed. I cut them down to 14 because there was not enough time for 18. But within that, that was the very first time I got to create 14 different women that looked different, different hair, different body types, and no one said the word no. I don't think, because there was not enough time in the schedule to really monitor what I was doing. But they also, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? But they also gave me that room. So it came across with 14 distinctly different people. But are those characters yours? No, of course no. not. But I did that because they were missing. So it doesn't matter if they weren't mine. They're there now. So if someone else draws it, they have to draw that. Right, but so you don't I'm get a, like a creator byline or I'm anything I'm not allowed to like talk that. about that. You can get me killed. <laughs> <laughs> there are Marvel assassins everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> they dress up in costume and they come get you at night. I live in Manhattan. I got to be careful. Which is why I'm saying most yeah. creators today, they're like, why would I bother doing that when I can, you know, I have these really cool characters that I'll just put in my own book. That's you true, know? and I, I do that. I do have my own titles, but if, if I'm looking across that landscape and you've opened this door for me to literally do something that does not exist there unless they force it, that's why I, I do this in the first place. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and I've created characters that I knew I was never going to get any kickback from, but just the idea that you love what you do, and they say, for this issue, we need a guy who can turn into water. You know, if you could design that character, that would be great. It never became an issue of, well, let's negotiate, and how much of this am I going to get? They're like, no, just kind of... And I, I hate to say, and I hate to be the real bearer here of bad news, because I love comics, I really do. But the, there is a process, there, there is a business to the comic business. And basically, if you take a stand where you're like, well, we need these characters, we're gonna, we got to create them for the book that's going to come out next month, please feel free to create. If you're sitting back going, well, what are you going to give me if I, if I do this? They're not going to give you anything, and if you refuse, they'll just get somebody else to, and then you're drawing whatever somebody else just did. They'll bring in, you know, whomever they have on staff, and then they'll create that. So, again, it's just much harder to do it from a corporate business than it is if you were just doing it from a grassroots, your own, you know, kickstarting. 
Do you feel the space for like diversity in comics is is better within the ind independent comics? Like, you know, maybe getting a deal with Image where you're just have free reign to do what you want, or you know, like you said, publishing your own book. You know, maybe there's not as many people that are reading it, but because you love it and you want to create that thing, do you think the space for diversity is better within independent comics than it is within like you know, say the big four, or the big five, or whatever? Yeah, without question. Yeah. Nowadays, with the way you can easily print things. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For sure. Because, yeah, when people come up to me, if someone comes up with a portfolio and they're showing me their stuff, and I'll ask them, I'm like, do you want to, you know, do your own thing or do you want to kind of play in the pond with Marvel and DC? And the reason why I ask that is because if you want to be, you know, Marvel and DC's pond, you get, there are certain <laughs> rules and parameters you have to follow. Whereas if you're doing your own thing, you can do whatever you want. You know, it's, there's sky's the limit you know so and i tell people like whatever you're passionate about you know either side of that you know definitely pursue that but yeah but just know if you want to come into marvel in dc you got to play by their rules you know so yeah if you self-publish it's like you, you have so much freedom because we did a, did a kickstarter for our book you know so the book was funded me and my my Friend Fernando Ruiz, we did the book, we wrote it and drew it. it we were amazed that we could, we were doing whatever the hell we want. I mean, there was like no, no editor telling us what to do. We, it was very, very freeing. And then when you bring it to somebody, um, you know, the, the book is a proven book. People have, you know, been interested in it. So, you know, and then when we, we did bring it to a publisher and they had some changes, we were like, well, we're not going to do that because we, we financed this book. Right. So you need this more than we we do. We can just bring it somewhere else. So you get a lot of freedom. That's awesome. It's nice. Yeah. So going down the line, if you could point to like one book that you're like, I feel like this is kind of like diversity embodied. What what comic would you guys recommend? Just you know, going down the line. That's coming out now, or has ever come out? Period. Just you know, when you see it, you're like, yeah, that's right. They got that really right. Independent or doesn't matter, no, just no, whatever. I, I always go say Love and Rockets. Gotta be careful. Love and Rockets. Right. <laughs> Love and Rockets always felt like it was just so um, diverse and open minded. I just always get that feeling from that book. I mean, this is from about thirty from thirty years ago till now. I can't think of one single one. Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> oh I'm wrecking. Um, Walking Dead does a you know, pretty good just real people. You know, from all experiencing horrible trauma. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. It's trauma all the way around. Um, I'm I'm super biased, but Miles Morales, like it, it uh, everybody there just is who they are, and they it, it they don't really, you know, it, it seems to reflect more accurately the population of New York, for example. You know, kind of everybody. It just feels natural, and you know, but I'm biased, so. <laughs> Yeah, I, and it's odd that you would see two people share the same passion, but Love and Rockets is amazing. It is. For its 30-year history, this is a book about two lesbians, essentially, yeah. coming out. Well, you could argue that one of them was, she goes both ways. Yeah. But it was very much uh, creator-owned, back when there really weren't creator-owned. Mm -hmm. And it was a book that came out, and it operated in real time so if three years went by for the book three years went by for the character and the character is still being done today but she she started off as you could argue maybe 16 17 and now she's in her 40s you know and it's so weird to see a character Age. i didn't i didn't grow up with love and rock i i'm late to the party i got to this party about two years ago and this party had been going on for a long time and it is so great to see that the Hernandez brothers, which is actually three brothers, but the, the one Jaime does uh, his particular title uh, with Maggie and Hopi, these two characters. And he just had this, this idea to keep them going. Uh, and they weren't superheroes. They weren't anything. They were, at the most, they, their aspirations were trying to be in a punk band or something, you know, but their stories were so real and so engaging that you couldn't, it, it almost felt like there was a sense of realism, which even today, I don't, I read a lot of comics today, but I will go back and read Love and Rockets because it is so 
open with their, uh, with their storytelling. You, you don't know that you're reading a comic. Most times you understand that this is a comic book format. With Love and Rockets, it's just a storytelling format, which was always just great. Um, so what I would like to do is, does anybody have questions for the panel? Was there a question, though? No. <laughs> Yeah, oh, totally. Yeah. No, you are you Hispanic? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, we See, I struggled with Hispanic. No, no, I and I agree. All we really had back in the day with Marvel was the White Tiger, and he wore a mask, so you couldn't even tell he was Spanish. You know, so, you know, I mean, and I get people who Do you guys, I mean, as he asked, do you guys feel that comics have progressed towards like a more diverse, I mean, I, I'm with him, I've been reading comics for a very long time, and the difference of comics from, you know, that I read in like the 80s and 90s is a world of difference between what it is now. Like, I mean, do you guys agree that it's at least progressing? Yeah, yeah definitely, <laughs> sure. definitely. I, I should hope we're getting to a better place, like mm -hmm. you said, where we don't have to have these conversations all the time. Yeah. I mean, uh, Oh, very go ahead. Slowly, go. Very, slowly. Very, yeah. very slowly and very, very forced. I personally would like to read a very good story, something that makes me excited about it. It's been a long time. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> well, uh, you know, comics are like, like any other medium. They're like movies or books. Whatever's popular, they're going to go on. If the gay thing is popular, then we'll do the gay thing. When the black thing becomes popular again, we'll do the black thing. You know, they're out to make money. If within that, a creator can come in and go, okay, somebody just opened the door. I don't know how long this door is going to be open for me, but yeah, I'm going to give them some seriously good gay characters because now that's popular and I can actually work within that medium. I don't, I mean, you know, I just recently, oh, I, is, is there anybody reading um, Wonder Woman, uh, Bionic Woman? That, that time, <laughs> and I, and Andy Mangles, who, uh, who's here, who is gay, he wouldn't mind me saying that because he says it himself often. Um, I <laughs> swear we us. are <laughs> on, um, we, there is a scene on Paradise Island. And of course we all know Paradise Island, well, from the movie, I guess. Yeah. It's all made up of women. And on there, I mean to ask him this. And if you guys see him before I do, I could swear that in one panel, he put a, a transgender woman on Paradise Island. So I'm like, I, I don't know if that's true, but I mean to ask him that. And the idea that he can do that, yeah, probably he couldn't have done that 10 years ago or 20 years ago. But the fact that, again, transgender is the hot topic that we're talking about right now, then people are more willing to go, all right, well, you know, let's sneak it in there or let's talk about it or let's do something. Let's, you know, have the TV show that has it or the movie or whatnot. So comics are just like any other medium. Whatever's popular is going to make its way in there as well. And the fact that it was a male character from the beginning. The Captain Marvel, you said? Ms. Marvel. Well, Miss Marvel, didn't Captain Marvel go into Miss Marvel? She's, she's like an Indian. Yeah. Okay, I haven't been reading up on it. Okay, my bad. It's okay. I, th I think, like you were saying, the Kamala uh, series is very successful, you know, uh, because they, they took, now that uh, Captain Mar uh, Carol is Captain Marvel, and so the Ms. Marvel title was, you know, they just, they thought, hey, let's bring this back with uh, somebody new. And the fact that she was, like most of these characters, wasn't promoted in any way as anything other than the new Ms. Marvel it was incidental that she was of color and was uh, Muslim and things like that. So when you read the book, you just, you're just reading about a teenage girl in Jersey City. And as you pick up on these details, it's just, they're just dropped in, you know, as life goes on. It's not like, hey, here's our new Muslim girl, you know, whatever. It's, it, it, it's just part of the character. And I think that's what, why it's successful is because she's not the Muslim character. She's just Ms. Marvel. You know, she's just Kamala. So uh, I think that that's what helped that succeed specifically. To have a disability or what, what was the... Visibility. Oh, visibility. To have more visibility for more diverse characters. In okay, so you said nothing about disability, but visibility. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow, just... yeah. That's a whole nother panel. <laughs> <of things. laughs> I mean, 
I, I agree that representation is important because it's, but it's one of those things that kind of, like somebody said, bleeds through, uh, where if you have more diverse creators, you'll get more diverse cast. But in a way, sort of like vice versa, it seems. It just like, as, as people are just, they stop caring about it anymore. You know, that's like she was touching on. If we can just get to the point where they're just, you know, we Everybody's don't have to force it down our throats. Right, yeah. Once once there's just new characters and people aren't worried about what, you know, what color or gender or whatever people are and just like them or dislike them based on, you know, how the story is or, how, you know, how the... Uh, but I don't think it'll ever go, because we're human. I think that's is part of being human, you know. It's just one of those natural bugs <laughs> that that human beings have yeah, and it is it is about ever get rid of it yeah it's mm -hmm. about popularity you know alan moore can come in and say hey i want to do this and he's more likely to get in than you know so and so who had a really nice hot run on a book can come in or grant morrison can come in and say i want to do this i want to take that character and change them it is, and there is this thing in comics. It used to be a, an artist's medium where Jim Lee or Rob Layfield, those guys could just come in and just draw and say, we'll, we'll add a story later. The story doesn't really matter. Now the shift, and I, I tend to agree with it, is more for the writer to come in and say, this is what I feel and this is what should happen. So just like in movies, you know, there used to be a time where Steven Spielberg could do no wrong and whatever he touched was gold. That concept also translates into comics. You get a really hot person, whoever that person is now, they can probably do a whole lot more for diversity or, or uh, exposure than, I say, the character they're working on. Uh, in the Kevin Merrick shirt, you persistent hand up. <laughs> well, I know now most comics lines like DC and Marvel, they have a, a child's or a children's readership collection. Uh, if they, some might still or, or may, may not have. ratings on a lot. And then, of yeah, they put a, a rating on the book itself to say this, is that just what like you movies. Mean more as far as like content good for, for, for middle schoolers? Well, I mean, that's subjective. You know, what I might think is a great story, you might have read going, oh my God, I, I fell asleep through this trash. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so it's, I think it's more, especially with the popular characters, the, the ones that are popular, like Robin is a really popular character with somebody in your classroom. It, it'll be upon you to go, well, let me see what really good Robin stories are out there or Swamp Thing stories or, you know, whatever character they tend to uh, focus on. There's so many that I think it's harder to really say, just read this line. Because like Dexter said earlier, there, are no, there is no continuity. So everything is just a series of mini-series. So you're just going to have to point out that one story. And from there, see if they like it and go on from there. Uh, we have time for one more question. We'll get... Yes. Bit. Well, I think that's where it comes into the genre itself. Because, yeah, you can look at a book like Saga and say, well, there's an interspecies relationship going on here. And you're like, yeah, but it, in our human minds, we're like, well, it's not a black or Asian or, or you know, Scottish or, or Peruvian. These are aliens that we don't, you know, know for lack of a better word. So I think that diversity fits within the genre that is sci-fi or horror or however else you write it. So I think it's a little harder to say, you know, if, if you're a diverse individual or you're a minority, read Saga because it really speaks to that minority. You know, the guy could come, well, I don't have horns. What did you, what did you mean by me being a minority in this set? So I don't think there are as many books being published. Again, Love and Rockets being a very good example of two Mexican girls who do nothing than just go through their day. That's a great book to introduce to somebody who wants to say, hey, I want some sort of a Hispanic book. Can you, uh, you know, steer me to that direction? So they're there, they're out there, but with the plethora of books that come out, it's so much harder to figure out what to show somebody who has a particular interest, I in think, my opinion. Oh, well, I think also um, when you're talking about uh, the way it's treated by genre, I think um, it's just it's uh, a lot less controversial, perhaps, to use fantasy or sci-fi genres because 
you can make analogs of situations and everyone can read into, you know, like this blue person and this green person and I can't tell what gender anybody is and stuff. Great, because then you can map onto it whatever, you know, it's, so that's, it's, it's a lot less controversial to make uh, things uh, more diverse, you know, with the alien or like the dragon type stuff. Whereas when you try to map it onto reality, that's when you get, you deal with the, you know, outrage culture and that kind of stuff because everybody's like, well, that's not exactly like me. Yeah, well, that's, that's exactly like this character, you know. But nobody's going, uh, like your example with uh, Saga, nobody's going like, well, my horns don't look like that or I don't, you know, it's obviously talking about an analogous situation. Yeah, I think so. with sci-fi, people are just naturally like, oh, we can, it has a, you can do a little bit more. You yeah. a little more freer. It's like being an independent artist. You know, doing it. You can do whatever you want to. And right. sci-fi kind of lends you to that. Yeah, with aliens and you know, just all this stuff. Star Trek, the original series. You know, back in the '60s, they got a. You could not show a white man kissing a black woman. That is unthinkable today. Who, who even thinks that? You know, you wow. Who, who would even think that's an issue? But in while it was the first interracial kiss, there were a lot. Of, what a lot of people don't know is that. TV was broadcast in, in sections. Certain areas chose to show certain episodes and certain didn't. And all in the Bible Belt, and you can read this up on this, they chose not to show that particular episode where Uhura and Kirk actually kiss because they thought that was just racially too diverse. So. It's weird. You're free with, more free with sci-fi. I totally agree. Mm -hmm. But, you know, coming from this lady perspective, you also, a lot of books I pick up, that's why I said earlier, I don't feel there's any book, not even Love and Rockets, because when I pick up these things and I read them, they're so far removed from me that they mean nothing to me. And then I only feel a kind of embarrassment, like someone stripped you naked. When they touch on something that's painful, a guy wouldn't see it as being painful. But when I read it, I feel that shock, and I ease it down, and I walk away from it, and I have yet to pick up a book that hasn't given me that shock. But with sci-fi, I think everybody kind of you get let off that hook so that you're not feeling that. But it also depends. Some people could look at aliens and say, look at what they're doing to that woman's body. Look what they're doing here. You'll still feel it and still see it. So how, which one really does reach that? Who's done it yet? Closest is sci-fi, because at least you could say, this is not like me. It's because it's that lack of total reflection. You're not hurting me with this. I can't really, Paradise Island finally made sense to me when it took it from a soldier's perspective, because I can't see how a group of women are going to live alone on an island for hundreds of years. My mother visits for two weeks, and I don't want to see that woman again <laughs> for a year. You know? And that's my own mother, much less all these set of women built a raft so fast they couldn't find me by tomorrow. So, but when they showed it in Wonder Woman, here it was, like, it made sense now. Now you made it make sense because of the story. They're soldiers, they're at their post, they're on guard. Oh my God, took all these long, long years for it to make, make sense to me. Because I was a kid and I knew something was wrong with that whole picture. <laughs> I couldn't tell what then, couldn't put my finger on it, but all of a sudden. So to me, it's a story, it's that driven story. When we don't have that story, what else do we have? We have nothing but a bunch of people crying, look at me, look at me, and look where's my reflection. Well, guys, thank you so much for coming to Diversity in Comics. Uh, we really appreciate you guys' input. It's always awesome to hear from the creators of the things that we love to read and consume. And we love them just as much as everybody yeah. else here. Yeah, so. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you.